It's not many of us who can't say we lived out a dream, but Brian could. He dreamed of being a cop. He dreamed of following his dad, whom he loved so much. He dreamed of following his dad's brother and his aunt's husband and his cousins. He dreamed of getting the bad guys off the street. He wanted to make a difference. Police Commissioner Bo Bratton remembering Brian Moore today at the funeral service on Long Island. And earlier today, Andrew spoke with former NYPD Chief of Department Philip Banks. Andrew? And Rich, with all of the current and active focus on divisions between police and the communities they serve, Banks remains focused on fixing those divisions. But we began our conversation with the emotions of a lifelong police officer who's attended, in his words, more NYPD funerals than he can remember. Chief Banks, thanks for joining us. Thank you. NYPD officer Brian Moore being laid to rest today. Uh, your thoughts, your emotions on such a tragic, such a difficult day? You know, when an officer is, uh, is, is killed um, for such a senseless, senseless act, um, I think uh, a little bit of all of us in New York City dies, and it's certainly uh, a little bit more if you're part of the New York City Police Department. Because you can sympathize with the officer. You realize that you've been in a million situations and encounters just like this officer. And for the active officers now, they understand that they can be in, in more coming in the future. So it's a, it's a tough day, and it'll be a tough day for a very long time for the New York City Police Department in New York City. Officer Moore's death is prompting more questions about the relationship between the police department and the community. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, Commissioner Bratton was quoted as saying, you almost have, have to go back to the late 60s or early 70s to see a time when there was so much anti-police sentiment in the country. Now, mm -hmm. the commissioner wasn't saying that that anti-police sentiment leads to greater police danger or, or even police being targeted, but certainly some have made that leap. Is that leap fair? Is that connection fair that anti-police sentiment is leading to anti-police violence? Um, I think it's fair that anti-police sentiment can lead to anti-police violence. Has it led in these particular cases? I don't think so. Um, not 100 percent sure about that. I certainly don't think so. Unfortunately, uh, police officers in New York City and across the country uh, have been killed from the days of policing. So to say that this anti-police sentiment causes it, I don't know whether or not you can get past the opinion stage on that. I don't know if you can have any data to actually factualize that. But certainly uh, anti-police sentiment is, uh, it's not good. And um, though some believe it's justified and maybe a lot of it is justified or some of it is justified, it certainly doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, do well. Do you agree with the commissioner that that level of anti-police sentiment, not action, but sentiment, is at a level that, he, that hasn't been seen since the 60s or 70s? Um, the commissioner is a little bit older than I, all right, so I didn't sense <laughs> the 60s. I will say that the anti-police sentiment now is the uh, highest and the thickest that I've ever, ever experienced in my, uh, my almost 29 years in law enforcement. Um, PBA President Pat Lynch and others have put the blame for these attacks uh, against police officers squarely on Mayor de Blasio, saying too much room for protest. Uh, val validating some of the protests, font fostering anti-police sentiment. Our Dominic Cotter uh, caught up with Pat Lynch today, and he, he said the mayor is finally beginning to hear the cops. That was his quote. But he also didn't back off of his uh, comments from earlier that the mayor has blood on his hands. How much of this anti-police sentiment do you put on a mayor de Blasio or a mayor Rawlings in Baltimore or other civic leaders for allowing protesters to have the room that they've had? You know, I think, I think it's a stretch. Um, I think uh, it's uh, a little bit unwarranted. This anti-police sentiment has been around for some time. It certainly predated uh, Mayor de Blasio. Now we can debate back and forth whether or not um, his first 16 months in office, uh, has he handled this particular issue to the best it could have been handled? Some say yes, some say no, some are neutral on it. I don't know if I can put that on him. I certainly don't know if I can put that on Mayor Scholings. But I think part of the problem and the issue becomes is that we're always looking to, to put it on somebody mm -hmm. rather than say, well, what part of it is valid and, and how can we work on that? So I'm not one to point fingers at anyone. I'm one to say, when you start pointing fingers, you can't come up with a solution. I, for one, think the solution is very easy. I think the step is very easy. Why it's not happening is certainly mind-boggling to me, and I think that Forget who is at fault. Let's figure out how our common ground. What is that solution? What is that step? Well, it's a lot of steps. The first thing you have to get that the police and the community have forgotten 
each other. They don't know who each other are. And it's human nature to have mistrust of an entity who you don't know are. So just take it in simplistic terms. You came up to me and you say, hey, Chief Bank, can I borrow $100,000? I don't know who you are. I certainly don't have $100 in my pocket. But certainly as we got to know each other and you asked me that same simplistic question, well, I know who you are. You're a little more valid. I may be more willing if I had the $100 to lend it to you. So what happens, what we saw over the last 20 years is that the metric systems in law enforcement has become um, law, uh, reduction of homicides, reduction of shootings, reduction of crime. It's the only metrics that was designed. So we just said that's our profit. And everything else for the most part went in the wayside. And what went in the wayside was the most valuable commodity was getting to know the community and the community getting to know the police. And I think we've lost that and we need to get back to that. Too much focus on the numbers and the stats, not enough on getting to know the people in the neighborhood, not enough community police. Absolutely. But on the t end of that, I think there's a large responsibility on the community's part because what happens, the police community relations equals the police are wrong and the community is right. And I stand here now to tell you that there's a lot of people in the community that bear that responsibility for that break. Down. It wasn't just law enforcement. They may have the ultimate responsibility mm -hmm. because they're, they're being paid to do that, but there's a lot of people in the community side that bear some responsibility in that breakdown. So where should, when it comes to these protests, where should the balance be? Because protesters certainly have the right and some would say the need to vent their anger and their frustration over cases like Michael Brown in Ferguson or Eric Garner in Staten Island or Walter Scott or St in Staten Island. There are so many of these cases. How do you balance that room to protest and express anger with maintaining respect for police and public safety? It can be done, and it can be done uh, pretty, pretty easily. In Baltimore, it was very unfortunate because uh, you certainly saw acts of violence, certainly acts of vandalism and criminal acts. That's where you have to draw the line here. People have the right to protest. The country was formed on protest. And I think the, one of the things that make this country the best country is the, in the world is that free speech and people are allowed to. I would say to the police unions, and I'm I think Pat Lynch is a, is a pretty, pretty good union leader. I've known him for a very long time. He used to work for me. And I think a lot of Pat Lynch, there have been police protests, right, where they protested right against Mayor Dinkins, and I certainly believe they protested against Mayor Giuliani. So to say that you can't have protests, and I don't, I don't, I'm sure he did not say that, but protests are allowed. But as the police chief, certainly if I was giving some advice to the mayor, when you start seeing vandalism, when you start seeing acts of violence, you certainly have to say no. But I will add to this, be clear about this one here, that the majority of those protests is one peaceful protest. Some of them are hijacked by mm -hmm. people who are coming into it and to, to causing. So let's separate that. I'm not going to give anybody a wide blanket here. There's 90% of those people in Baltimore were peaceful protesters that were victimized by the criminals that got involved with it as well. And that's when you particularly have to draw the line. There, there's another angle that I want to get to here, Chief. A lot of focus we've seen on First Amendment issues, the mm -hmm. speech and assembly rights of the, of the protesters. Mm -hmm. We haven't heard a lot about Second Amendment issues. Officer Moore was killed by an illegal gun. Mm -hmm. Officers Lou and Ramos, they were shot with an illegal gun and a killer who had a gun crime history. Police chiefs across the country have been calling for sensible gun control, background checks, assault weapon bans, expanded ammo clip bans, things like that. Um, I'm curious your thoughts, because the same crowd that's been worried or complaining about protesters and these First Amendment rights, I don't get the sense have the same concern <laughs> about those Second Amendment issues. Absolutely. You know, I, I would, you know, I took a, a, a studies at Monterey, uh, out of Monterey, California, at the Naval Postgraduate Studies, and I remember speaking to one of my colleagues about uh, gun control. And he actually had changed my mind on the issue big. I thought that it was a federal responsibility, and he thought it was a state responsibility. And after speaking with him, he actually made me think about it. In New York City, I can't speak for other states, in New York City, we need complete, strict gun control laws. And if there are other states that are, have lax laws and allow those guns to free, uh, to free flow into New York mm -hmm. City, then there's something that needs to be done. And then at that point, maybe the feds need to be able to come in and to intervene. Uh, you have to stop these guns. It's not enough to say that guns don't kill, criminals kill. And that's absolutely uh, correct. But when you have individuals like this particular person who, who, who killed this young officer before his life, was even started. He impacted thousands and thousands and thousands of people by this callous act. So I certainly am a big believer in cities like New York City, in Chicago, in Baltimore. You need tough, tough laws. And if those other states uh, uh, need to toughen up their laws so we won't have this free flow that these guns coming down these highways killing uh, officers and, and killing anyone for that matter. And hopefully that's a conversation that picks back up again. Yes. Chief Phil Banks, formerly with the NYPD, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody at the table think that this gets better sooner than later?
that there is a way. He seemed to say that there was a third way. There's the protesters. There's, in many cases, um, a defensiveness on the part of police that they feel that they're being attacked for the main doing their job. But is there, can there be brokered not just peace between these communities and law enforcement, but also changes in policies so that people think that there's equal justices? Is there a solution here? I think there is, but I'm not sure we've sort of reached the critical point that would enable every every side to see it and embrace those solutions. What do we need a city I, to burn down? I or? think no, but I, I I'm not sure that that this fuel has burned itself out right now. I mean, there are still going to be incidents and people are still going to react to it. At some point, I think folks are going to get frustrated and communities will start to accept greater interaction with police and police might accept body cameras and, and other things that are designed to change the dynamic a little bit. Uh, and maybe you do have that outreach and the, and the greater investment in community policing and the walking away somewhat from the stat-driven policing uh, that Chief Banks was talking about. I just don't know if we're there yet to, to create systemic changes from both sides. Who is that person who does it? I mean, well, you can't I, just say it's a mayor because you look at the mayor of Baltimore and then you look at, I mean, it's not whether they are R's or D's in front of them, whether they're white or black, you still have the systemic frustration in the communities. Um, so but like, who brokers it's, this? It's, we have to talk about like the lens of the conversation here. There is always going to be a hostile dichotomy between areas in high crime and police. That, that it, this didn't happen overnight. You have a very anti-snitch mentality of even law-abiding people that don't want to tell police what they saw would happen. Thank God in this case with Brian Moore, at least the community you know, helped lead to find the perpetrator and to his arrest. But I think you have, there was a series of incidents of our leaders who made inflammatory statements that helped encourage this mentality. You skipped You're a little talking step, about This didn't, as look, you say, come at, out of left field. It didn't, we saw the videos at, in South Carolina. We've seen the videos in this. But look at Brian Moore's case. He was, it was a stop and frisk um, police tactic mm -hmm. that he used to get that gun off the street. If that didn't happen, God knows what could have happened. It, the, he could have shot another african-american young boy and is that where's the outrage over that it's like you cannot have this conversation in a problem. vacuum and but you're it, talking but here's about my only a few problem. cases if i follow that logic right we should never have touched the policy at all um that was going on in new york at the time where literally you were approaching a million stops um and when you looked at who was being stopped there was building and percolating all this frustration in the community Crime rate hasn't gone through the roof here uh, since they've changed the policy. Still kept it, but not utilizing it nearly to the degree it was before. To say that it's only that the community's got to get their act together, I think would be uh, That's naive. not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. But that policy, um, and that not, there's always things you can do to tweak policing. And I think certainly a, a more community-based approach, you can certainly try to do that more. But at the end of the day, in some of these high-crime gang areas, it, it, you're dealing yeah. with very violent criminals and you know it takes a tough approach to deal with that and save lives and I think what you saw there's a lot that can be done but you saw under Ray Kelly it didn't even take it why did it take that rhetoric from the mayor at the outset it, it, and it snowballs into this I don't think he put it all on so de Blasio, but he certainly all, didn't but help. He's certainly culpable um, in some of it. Well, some say he stopped the riot and some also say he created more of a divide but do you have any optimism this gets better? I wish I could say yes, but I but I really don't see it, Richard. And I'm saying that based on a 30-year experience of covering this. The truth of the matter is, and I'm not blaming the black community, but communities of color have problems. Cops are sent in to serve as a social worker to a very dysfunctional situation. If they hesitate for one second, they could end up like the cop today that I watched those thousands of cops in tears as a 25-year-old man on a Friday night is his funeral. Think about that for a second. 20, he will never know what it is to have his children, his family, 25 years old. So I understand both sides. And this is what cops have been telling me for years. If they hesitate for one second, it could mean the end of their life. And so... I mean, when you deal, Jessica brought up a good point, and, and, and this is some of the dysfunction I don't understand. 
How can he be popular not to snitch and report a crime when, when someone could have robbed a neighborhood teacher that's trying to turn their lives around or the senior citizens in the community? I mean, Richard, it's, we've, I, I, I wish we had the time tonight. We don't. But see, what, what's not talked about, because nobody, you know, if a white person says that you're a racist, you know, the problems of the black community. And there are a lot of problems. As simple as that. Okay, and you're right. Uh, you don't solve it um, in one night, but you would hope such a tragic day like today was. Um, put a little perspective on everything as to where we are. Um, but unfortunately, I think these guys are right. Um, there's going to be more bad days ahead um, until we uh, try and find a way to get forward on this thing. All right. Uh, when we come back, we will transition to politics. Mr. Skelos uh, does not seem uh, willing to go quietly into the good night. We'll tell you about that. Also, Jessica will tell you why Staten Island um, went the way it did. Um, and also, um, Jeb Bush, interestingly, talking about what role his brother might play in his administration. Uh, we'll be right back.